Hi, Peter. How are you? Hi, how are you? Doing well. Thank you. Um, I, I love the show and I loved your, uh, I find your work like extremely, uh, extremely fascinating because this, I just love to shadow you for like a year if I could. But um, <laughs> so like you're working very intimately with Chris for, I think like a better part of a year, maybe a little more than that. Um, what did you sort of like grasp? Because we've seen Chris Hemsworth, the movie star, but now you get to work with Chris Hemsworth, the man, and you get to see how much effort he puts into his daily craft. So like, what did you sort of just learn from him, like working so close together? Yeah, I mean, that's that's sort of one of the real pleasant surprises of this whole thing. Um, you know, when we when we started this project, uh, when Darren and, and, and I started talking about this, um, we had a certain actor in mind for it who we both knew very well already. And, you know, and then when at the last minute due to scheduling stuff and it kind of made more sense to, you know, bring someone else in and that someone was Chris, um, I was like, oh, that, that's great. I'm going to get to know somebody new, but I didn't know that that person would be a person I would like so much. And, um, you know, I think anybody who's met Chris will just immediately speak to kind of the kind of guy he is, which is absolutely the real deal. And you just, when you're with him, there is no thing about this guy being like the biggest movie star in the world. Um, and yeah, I mean, he works incredibly hard and uh, that means he's incredibly regimented about his training. One of the things I think people probably don't understand about being quote unquote, a movie star is the hours that they work are insane, you know, and Chris has probably never had more than four to six weeks off in the last six years. So that means he has to be able to incorporate his training into his day job which means a lot of times he's got to do these workouts at really horrible hours. And, you know, when he's exhausted and he's, you know, freezing cold or whatever. So, um, you know, he's, he's really relentless in pursuit of his craft. And um, I also was just kind of blown away by how quickly he embraced the challenges. And a lot of these challenges, you know, it's, they were sprung on him in real time on film. Right. So it's not like he had a chance to prepare for, some of the things that he had to do um, beyond kind of what you as the viewer are seeing on screen. And I, that actually was probably the thing that surprised me the most was the ability that he had to very quickly learn something new and uh, adapt to whatever stress was put on him. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then, so like, I want to hop through the episodes, but it's like one of the first, I think the episode you appear in is the shock episode and you do work with him um, to, in the sauna. And so, but we also see him like uh, work with, you know, work in the extreme cold. So like, as you're, um, as it's getting colder or as like, as it's getting uh, hotter, it's like when you're, um, is it beneficial to continue training outside in the cold for this longevity, the, the longevity that you're uh, talking to with Chris, or is it something that you should be doing more acute, like maybe just like a 30 seconds hour shower or something like that? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, the data on cold versus heat as it pertains to longevity at this point in time looks as follows. Uh, I think the evidence in favor of heat therapy, which sauna is the data for which we have the most, uh, is, is the modality for which we have the most data. So, so specifically the use of dry sauna, which is what we did in that episode. Um, I think the data are very compelling, though far from ironclad, because much of it is epidemiologic that regular exposure, you know, 20 minutes, at least four times a week at a high temperature, you know, north of about 180 degrees Fahrenheit, that there really are health benefits of doing that, specifically with respect to risk reduction of cardiovascular disease and neurodegenerative disease. When it comes to the cold side, the data aren't really there yet that, that you know, intermittent cold exposure is going to add to your lifespan. Um, however, there are certain benefits, I think, that come from cold, probably with respect to um, uh, mental health. So I think there are real benefits uh, in terms of even brief exposure to really cold water, for example, uh, in terms of some of the neurochemicals that get released as a result of that that are very uh, favorable with respect to mood. Uh, and I think there's a clear advantage to cold exposure, whether it be ice bath or things like that, as it comes to reducing inflammation. And I think that can be very important as an adjunct to training. Uh, so again, a big part of you know living longer is exercising, and you know exercising can take its toll on your body. It's a, it's acutely a very stressful thing. So it's you know it's a little bit about kind of managing that. Yeah, and then you in the strength episode you do talk about um, like because Chris does all the muscle like you know he's doing all the weightlifting he has 
huge muscle. And, but you show him it's like uh, that he's not quite there with the endurance. I'm sure he's further along than most the regular Joe like myself. But um, so like what kind of uh, endurance guy? I know the series sort of emphasizes swimming and how it can be such a strong thing, but like running, boxing, any sort of cardiovascular, like just that gets the heart rate pumping. Or is there the specific things that you should be looking for when you're sort of um, doing the, the, the endurance training? Yeah, I mean, I think the most well-crafted cardio training program, probably, regardless of which modality you use, should be about 80% at relatively low intensity and about 20% at relatively high intensity. And that's true really across the gamut, right? So if you look at the best endurance athletes in the world, which are probably professional cyclists, you know, professional runners, you know, so the people that are winning, the, you know, winning the Boston Marathon and winning the Tour de France, you know, they might be training 25 to 30 hours a week, but they're still following that formula. 80% of it is still at what is for them a very low intensity. Now, if you or I tried to go out and keep up with those guys on their low intensity day, we wouldn't last six minutes, literally, but it's all relative to your level of fitness. And so the question is probably less about, should it be swimming? Should it be cycling? Should it be running? It should be is it something you enjoy enough that you can spend 80% of your time doing it? And can you do it safely? Because that's the other principle here, which is, you know, you can't get injured doing these things. So you just have to have the biomechanics for it. So, you know, I used to love running. I don't run anymore. I do a little bit. I'll sprint. But I just think at my age, the risk reward isn't quite there. And I can ride a bike without any impact and, you know, pound out more of that time that I need doing it. And I think another thing you have to factor in is, you know, what works with your lifestyle as far as, you know, do you live in a cold climate where it's harder to be outside or do you like cross country skiing and you live in a place where you can do it? Um, I think that the higher intensity stuff gets a lot more attention. You know, I think people, you know, are more inclined to think I'm going to go out and do a, a boot camp or a hit workout. And those things are, they're important, but you, you never want to forget that you have to have a big, you have to have a big base to the pyramid to build a high peak. And, you know, the high intensity stuff is the peak, but the higher you want that peak, the bigger you actually need that base. And that base comes from that steady state, modest intensity cardio training. Yeah, and no, I got into the uh, long distance uh, cycling this summer and I, my knees are thinking. <laughs> um, but um, so like, I, we see him do the swim, we see him do the, uh, the climb, but it felt like the most intense thing that you put uh, Chris through was the four day of the fasting. And um, was how, what was that sort of experience? And what's sort of the, um, when do you sort of like see the effect? Because I, I think you said in the show, um, it takes about three days before you really see those ketones start to pop. It's like, yeah. and I think you mentioned that you kind of, or you sort of alluded to that you've done it longer. So where have you kind of seen like the best results? Um, I think four days was pretty good to just like jump in cold turkey. Four, four days was a big first fast and uh, Chris had never fasted before. And he didn't get a chance to prepare for it because literally he was finding out about it the day we talked about it on camera. So that was like, he literally was learning when we were having our last meal, that that was going to be our last meal. Um, and, and four days is big. I think for your first time doing a fast, uh, you know, three days is a lot. Um, so again, fasting is a, is an interesting tool. I don't think it's a tool that necessarily would apply to everybody because you have to be careful about how much muscle mass you're willing to spare. Because that's really the, the, you know, fasting comes with all these metabolic benefits in the short run and potentially the long run. It also comes with a very acute short-term consequence, and that is the loss of lean tissue. And that's why Chris was a, an ideal candidate for it, because he has so much lean tissue and he has so much muscle mass. We knew we could put muscle mass back on him, so it wasn't really a problem. Um, and then on top of that, of course, you know, Chris being Chris, of course, he has more challenges to do. For most people, when you're doing your first water only fast, it's, you know, just being able to walk around is a challenge. And as you saw in the episode, I mean, Chris had to learn how to spearfish. And, uh, you know, I, it, it blew my mind what he was able to do because I, I really, I thought there was a very good chance we were not going to eat that night and that he was not going to be able to catch a fish for dinner. Yeah, no, that, that was a great, I mean, the, the, just the shot is amazing. And so like, like you mentioned earlier, like the nag, like you want to sort of avoid the injuries, the sort of uh, like the sort of nagging injuries, but has in your research, uh, when you're doing these different, uh, you know, practices like endurance training, uh, 
shock training and it's like have you noticed any sort of like properties that maybe help accelerate the healing like what you're doing like the cold water showers or something has you sort of excel maybe like if you're having wrist because chris was having wrist and ankle sort of issues throughout the training definitely the cold can help with that um ultimately though i think a, a lot of it comes down to identify you know in chris's case look the ankle was you know i mean that's just a flip that goes that you know, those types of injuries are going to happen. I think the more common injuries people have tend to be acute on chronic, meaning they do something and they say, oh, I tweaked my knee. But the reality of it is there is an underlying imbalance there that predisposed them to that injury. And I think those are the areas where you're going to get the most bang for your buck in the management of injuries. In other words, injury management is about prevention. It is about understanding what are the instabilities that lead to lower back pain, right? Like why is it that you know half of Americans, perhaps more, could be as could be three quarters of Americans will experience at least one significant bout of lower back pain in their lifetime. And the reality of it is, even if you one day bend down, pick something up and your back goes nuts, it didn't you didn't just hurt it at that moment. That was just the straw that broke the camel's back. So it's really going and finding out what are the movement patterns that begin with your breathing pattern, by the way, that are predisposing you to the imbalances that render you susceptible to that, which I think, again, just speaks to this broad concept of everything in this field of longevity comes down to early, early identification and, and prevention. Gotcha. And so like, I mean, Chris is Chris and he's one of one, but like yeah, when, you're, exactly. when, you're when you're dealing with your uh, regular patients, like if you were like, if I was one of your patients or something. Like what are like maybe like three or five steps like you would sort of give this like start because it's not like it's not a, it's not a race it's sort of a marathon where you're taking beats like what are like actionable changes that people can make in their everyday sort of lives to uh, get you know just get started on this journey uh with respect to exercise or just in general everything just in just in general the yeah i mean i think on the nutrition side probably the things we want to make sure of the most are understanding do they need to be in a caloric deficit or are they at, are they, you know, calorically fine? So that's an important distinction to make. And then most importantly of the calories is, is your protein. So where are you on protein intake? Cause I do think most people are actually under muscled, clearly not a problem for Chris, but the average person walking around probably doesn't have sufficient muscle to get them to the end of their life, the way we envision them getting there. So a big part of that is having adequate protein intake and having it spaced out the right way and having the right proteins and then pairing that with the right kind of training. So protein would be one. I think the other one is really having a well-structured exercise program that emphasizes all the things we talked about with cardio. So using that 80-20 rule in intensity. And then on the strength side, it's basically making sure that you have a really well-rounded strength program. And again, that's going to vary depending on the patient. If it's a patient who comes to me who's never lifted weights before, well, it's going to look very different. They don't need much stimulus to improve, but they can get injured very easily and they can get hurt very easily. If it's, you know, if you're coming to me and you said, hey, I've been lifting weights my whole life. Great. Now it's about saying, well, are we doing the right things? And are you lifting heavy enough? And are you lifting uh, the right, you know, muscle groups enough. And, and usually, as you know, it's not just one muscle group. It's really about combining movements that use multiple muscle groups that impact day-to-day -day stuff. And then I think, you know, just rounding it out, I mean, the lowest hanging fruit on this is sleep. Uh, it's, it's really making sure that a person is getting the optimal recovery uh, in bed. And, and, you know, sleep is probably the most underappreciated nootropic we have, uh, meaning the thing that promotes, you know, even day to day, just cognitive function. There's no quicker way to rob a person of their cognitive function than to sleep deprive them. Yeah, and I noticed in the series also when you're when you're sharing a meal with uh, Chris, you don't really like waste any like piece of that salad that he's that you guys are eating in like the first episode. And so I was like, what are your sort of uh, nutritional like go like what are, what kind of meals are you looking for? Is like because you do eat he's eating fish but chris is eating pretty much anything and it's like but you're also you're very disciplined about it so what sort of uh what are, what are you sort of following like when you're um picking out your meals for, throughout the day or throughout the week well again i anchor first and foremost to protein so most of my eating kind of revolves around getting my you know my amount of protein which is for me it's sort of getting uh 25 percent of my protein four times a day and i'm trying to target about one gram of protein per pound of body weight so in other words i'm 
really trying to target a quarter of a gram of protein for uh, for every pound of body weight four times a day. And, and then after that, you know, how do I fill in the gaps? Well, I mean, I'm, you know, we used a continuous glucose monitor at times during the, the show. So it's sort of understanding glucose tolerance, you know, how much carbohydrate can a person metabolize? Somebody like Chris can eat a lot of carbohydrates. He's got a lot of muscle. He's very insulin sensitive. Um, other people might need less carbohydrate. Um, and then of course, just kind of having a sense of like, do you need to be in caloric excess? Are you trying to actually gain weight? Uh, are you trying to lose weight and are you trying to fix some of the underlying metabolic things that can, you know, result from excess calories in your life, such as fatty liver disease, which of course is an enormous epidemic right now. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Um, this has been really great. It's been great, uh, great to talk to you. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Thank you very much.